Fun fact, my parents didn't actually let me watch Lemonade Mouth when I was a kid because they thought Lemonade Mouth was a metaphor for a person who curses a lot. Well, look at me now, Mom. I never watched the movie and I still curse. Not gonna do it now, but trust me, I have some choice words later in this video. There's not much of an introduction I can really give this movie, to be honest with you. The thing that I can really touch on is that this is Bridget Mendler's first Disney Channel movie after joining the cast of Good Luck Charlie. That's, that's pretty much about it. Based on a book by the same name, this movie was released on April 15th, 2011 with some, quite frankly, pretty impressive reviews. I mean, this is probably the most positively reviewed movie I've watched on the channel thus far. I think it's the only movie I've watched to also win any awards. That's right, kids, the Emoji Movie and Morbius didn't win any awards, but Lemonade Mouth did. And they say the Oscars aren't rigged. Also, I'm not gonna touch on the book because I'm pretty sure only four of you read it, and according to the wiki, they didn't even change that much that's actually worth mentioning. To put it simply, this movie got a metric f ton of viewers. Okay, I don't know what it is about IMDb, but every single movie I've reviewed on this channel, without fail, IMDB has always rated it the lowest, so I'm choosing to ignore it this time. Because at this point, their opinion is just wrong. But yeah, there really isn't that much to touch on in terms of Lemonade Mouth, so let's just get straight into it. Quick side note, I recorded most of the movie footage in 720p on accident. I did that intentionally with my Spy Young People video in order to give it more of a nostalgic feeling, but I didn't even notice it when I was watching this movie because my 27-inch 1440p monitor makes everything look good no matter how ass the quality actually is. So thanks for being such a great product, ASUS Gaming Monitor. This movie starts out with our five main protagonists in detention. So, yeah, this movie starts out by being a derivative of The Breakfast Club. Not off to a great start. On the bright side, at least this group is ethnically diverse. The detention teacher is played by Tisha Campbell, who is having a little itty bitty existential crisis. Also, I'd like to point out that this movie begins at the end twice. Like we already get a scene of the group getting ready to perform and then it cuts to detention and then it cuts to the true beginning of the story. So that's oh. stupid. But we are officially introduced to our first main character, Stella. If any of the main characters are gay, it's her. And technically, I'm not wrong because she is played by Haley Kiyoko. She's also a transfer student. That's probably an important detail, but I get the feeling it's more of a plot device than anything. Our next character, named Wen, is seen with his dad dropping off his 28-year-old girlfriend, Sydney, at her college photography class. This is a detail that's probably important, but I get the feeling that it's more of a plot device than anything. Wen is adverse to his dad dating a 28-year-old woman. Gotta say, that's pretty based of him. But we never actually get the dad's age, so I'll hold my reservations for now. But he is pulling a little bit of a Scott Pilgrim with this sh Our next main character is Beck, played by not Avon Yogia. His parents are weird, but he's weirder because he's an indie kid. Next we meet Mohini, played by Naomi Scott. She's Indian, which automatically makes her father a conservative Muslim, because this movie came out in the early 2010s. That is the only thing that this scene addresses. I'm not trying to be racist when I say that. Trust me, if I was trying to be racist, you'd know. Next we meet Scott, Moe's boyfriend. Calling it now, they break up by the end of the film. Stella is already in trouble for wearing a shirt that says question authority. This is where we're introduced to the classic hard-ass principal, Stanley Brennigan. This isn't related to anything, but oh my god, Haley Kiyoko is fine as hell. In my Scott Pilgrim video, someone managed to get Kaylee Morg in my comments section when I referenced her, so please, for the love of god, let that happen here. Even more unrelated, but the principal reminds me of Bowser from the 1993 Mario movie. Wendell gets ready to present his history project, but quickly realizes that his project got swapped with Sydney's photography homework. Sydney goes to Wendell's class to swap it out, and this guy says exactly what we're all thinking. Mommy. But after Wendell has an outburst at the class for assuming that Sydney is his mom, he has now landed himself a spot in detention. As well as Mohini for skipping class to be with her boyfriend. Scott didn't get detention because he's a soccer player, and soccer important. Although this guy annoys the absolute hell out of me, I do have to say, he is whipping this shit around. But we learn in this scene that every single one of the arts programs has had their budgets reduced to zero. And all of the money has been put into sports programs. Because art make kids stupid, and sport make kids strong. This girl gets detention for reading in a closet. Like, bruh, she was harming no one. This isn't even during class. Beck is also on the soccer team, and he sucks at soccer. But after Beck tries to throw a soccer ball at the kid who's been nothing but a douche to him, he ends up hitting the coach instead, and he too is sent to the gulag. Okay, I love Stella, and she is indeed rocking the hell out of this blazer. 
And although she is based as hell, she's also dumb as hell. Because the principal gives a speech about empowering students, and she took that shit personally. And she gets up and gives a speech about, I don't know, her rights or something? Like, girl. I am with you, but you sound so damn foolish right now. But still, it gets the same reception as this movie and ends up getting some pretty mixed reviews. Now, I do want to say, although I agree with her, she isn't technically correct. Her school is allowed to enforce a dress code, even if it is stupid as hell. I also will point out that although, no, her shirt didn't technically break the dress code, she had other options than inciting a riot. Me personally, I would have just taken the blazer off. Anyway, this whole stunt unsurprisingly lands her in detention. So wait a second, reading in a closet and causing general anarchy are both worth one day in detention? Yeah, that seems fair. Moving on, Stella heads to the basement, where detention is held. This is where she meets Lyle, a member of the AV club, and Stella also finds out that the principal puts pretty much anything that isn't a sports program down here. But finding out news that depressing has the tendency to make you pretty thirsty for some organic lemonade. So all five of the main characters get a lemonade. In case you're curious, yes, this is the same machine, they just came at five different times. After the students arrive at detention, Ms. Resnick leaves immediately to go complain more to the principal about the music club's low budget. This this will surely be a fruitless effort, but our main characters begin to get into the rhythm with some well-timed water droplets and rhythmic taps and claps. Dear God, Stella, I love you, but you seriously look dumb as hell right now. The group starts singing about how being in detention is kinda cool. Now, I'm not a soulless monster, and I will admit that this song goes moderately hard, a solid 7 out of 10, but this is a really weird and inciting incident. They must have put something in that damn lemonade because they all start singing the exact same song. Like, I know it's a movie, but these people don't even know each other's first names yet, dog. Speaking of which, I didn't skip the introduction for Bridget Mendler's character, Olivia. She just didn't get one, but I guess being the movie's narrator is kind of enough. Miss Resnick comes back and she decides that all of these kids need to be heard. And I agree with that, because not only do these kids have some supernatural chemistry, but they were all born with perfect pitch. So their career paths are either this or Disney Kid, and we know how that ends for four of them. Miss Resnick immediately suggests that they sign up for Rising Star, a talent show where the winner immediately gets a record deal. That sounds like it would cause quite a few legal problems. But it's fine, because they all say they don't want to anyway. Olivia actually has a valid reason for this, because she has crippling anxiety but everyone else just says they don't really want to do that with their Thursday afternoon. They all had their separate ways, and Olivia goes home to her grandmother and an elderly cat who won't eat anything. So... That's depressing. But we get to see Wen's hot mom again, so that more than makes up for it. The next day, Stella texts everyone and wants to talk to them about finally forming that band they've been talking about for all those hours. How did Stella even have anybody's phone number? Also, Jesus Christ, Wendell, what the hell is wrong with you? Stella announces that she has already signed them up for Rising Star, as well as the school's Halloween bash, which no one actually has a problem with. They're not even slightly inconvenienced by this. None of them have plans or anything, no? So they play heads or tails to decide whether or not they'll actually do it. This is stupid because all of them said they already wanted to anyway. The group has their first practice session, but for some reason, they all suck now. Mo and Beck decide it's time to go, but this is a movie about people who are only good at music when the plot requires it. So Wendell starts playing the piano and everybody just literally sits their asses down and starts playing again. I'm not skipping over anything. They literally go from not knowing what they a B sharp is to singing an entirely original piece that admittedly goes hard in the span of 32 and a half seconds. Mo goes to meet up with Scott, who is royally pissed that half of his set time has now gone to Stella's band which he didn't even know that Mo was a part of. Mo literally asks Scott to his face if he even knows who is playing in the band, and he says, yeah, a bunch of nobodies. I really hope that this guy gets hit with an 18-wheeler by the end of this film. He also tells her that if she wants to be in a band, she can just play backup guitar for him. I'm not sure if that's sexist, but that feels pretty sexist. But it doesn't matter because he's a professional gaslighter and he gets her to at least think about pulling out of the Halloween bash. And before anyone says that I used the word gaslighting wrong, no, I literally didn't. Mudslide Crush, which is Scott's band, performs here. The song isn't terrible, but it's Scott's band and I fucking hate him, so I'm skipping it. Beck points out that everyone is drinking lemonade and they talk about finally getting a band name. Olivia goes to get another lemonade but finds a death threat waiting for her 
her instead. I'd also like to point out that Olivia hasn't even finished her first lemonade yet. Seriously, who the f likes lemonade so much that they have to get a second one before they even finish their first? Who the hell likes any drink that much, for that matter? Actually, you know what? Probably Homelander with breast milk. Olivia buys herself a drink, and this girl literally just steals it. And then these groupies start harassing her. Wen says to leave her alone, but because Ray is a bratty bottom, he asks if he's going to make him. Lord have mercy, do I miss my ex right now? Ray begins to literally assault Beck, so Stella takes it upon herself to spit on him. Uh, by the way, I, uh, I got, I got next. When explaining what happened to the principal, Ray calls Stella Lemonade Mouth. They say it in the narration that that is where the name came from, but they never actually formally say it to each other. Wen says that Stella told him to go write songs with Olivia, but gauging by Olivia's reaction, that's probably not the truth. Okay, really? More lemonade? How much lemonade can this girl drink? They begin writing and Bro just casually drops Determinate. F you if you disagree with me on this, but Determinate defined a generation. We also find out that Olivia's cat is the last thing that her mom left behind before she left, and her dad is not in the picture either. Wen and Olivia begin to sing a duet, but it's not Determinate, so I'm not really that sure I care. I don't give a flying f if this song is good. You put Determinate in my head, and it's going to stay there. The next day, the gang finds out that their cocaine dealer is being removed. This is because of the drink Turbo Blast that is sponsoring the school. I'm not sure if sponsorships allow you to remove all alternative drink options from a school. I'm sure Michelle Obama would have had something to say about all the healthy alternatives being removed. Sydney is now also moving in with Wen's family, and his dad has now proposed to her. It's just funny to me that Wen doesn't know what all of this stuff in when he walks in. This is a funny reference to the fact that he never learned how to read. Wow. We also find Scott essentially cheating on Mohini. What a damn surprise. I would have never seen this coming. The band also can't find Olivia. This is a reference to the fact that she has crippled anxiety and they thought she would get up on stage after a week and a half of practice. They find Olivia in the bathroom puking her guts out from nervousness. Lucky for the group, Stella keeps that mother thing on her and she has a can of lemonade just ready to go. This gives Olivia the burst of energy she needs to go out and perform. This is a reference to Popeye the Sailor Man. And this is a reference to the fact that I'm done making that joke. The group gets on stage and sings to terminate. I'm sorry it took me 12 years to realize it, but this song goes f***ing hard. There is not a single flaw in this song, and I was a pessimistic and arrogant child for not realizing this. And for this transgression, I do not deserve God's grace. Even the white boy rapping is straight fire. Eminem be damned. The last part I'll touch on is I appreciate the songs in this movie actually being three minutes long. I don't know, it always annoyed me in musicals when they would only sing like a minute and a half of a song that was clearly written to be three minutes long. Stella also takes the time out of their set to tell the students that they're removing the lemonade machine from the basement and that they're giving the sports team special treatment. They then immediately start singing another song, but it's not to terminate, so I don't care. No, all jokes aside, this song is actually just a solid 5 out of 10. It sounds wildly underdeveloped compared to the last song. This song sounds like it was performed live, because it is, but Determinate sounds like it was made in a studio. But Stella's act of rebellion pisses off President Bowser and he shuts down the performance and they meet up in the office next day. He does say that the students are talented, but he also says that the speech that Stella gave was completely out of line. Which, once again, is technically correct, because you have to remember, the school is sponsored. He is quite literally legally obligated to get rid of the lemonade machine, even if it is stupid as hell. He then tells the band that it's time to disband. Lemonade Mouth has officially played their first and last sour note. Do you guys like that one? It took me an hour and a half to come up with. Okay, fine. Nathan came up with it. But yes, he tells Lemonade Mouth that they are no longer allowed to play again. At least not on the school grounds, because there's literally no way he can enforce that anywhere else. It hardly seems to matter though, because the school loves Lemonade Mouth now. They're on posters everywhere and in school newspapers. Basically, the entire school became Lemonade Mouth dick writers overnight. Wen and Stella get the group a gig at a pizza bar. The group seems fine with it at first, but Mo is the only one who has to bail because she has homework to do. I'm not making that up, no. That's the actual reason she gives to not take a life-changing opportunity. But after she bolts outside, they see that their reach has somehow already left the school, and they literally have already put a giant-ass advert on the pizza parlor. How in the hell did they not see this when they walked in? I mean, yeah, sure, it is entirely possible, but 
Highly unlikely that they did it while they were inside eating, but I seriously doubt that. But this is enough to make everyone want to start playing at the pizza parlor as a regular gig. Okay, Mo, what the what the hell are you doing here? They literally eat here, lady. Come on. Bro is trying to work. This song is good. There's not much to comment on here besides the utter lack of janitorial consideration taking place in this pizza parlor. Don't come crying to me when you get a tapeworm from eating all the dirt particles that were on your shoes. The group goes to check on Olivia the next day because she didn't show up to school and we learn that Nancy has passed away. Yes, I said passed away. Contrary to popular belief, I am still black and it is ingrained in my DNA for me to say that. The group cheers up Olivia by looking at the clouds but everyone else gets sad and vents about their problems like it's a teenage dating discord server or some sh and Olivia drops the bomb that her dad is in prison. They don't say for what exactly he's in prison for, but my personal headcanon is that he stole seven to 10 metric tons of lemonade and then made Olivia drink it every night with her dinner. And that's why she's addicted to it now. It's the only thing that she has left of him. Or I don't know, maybe he killed someone. But as a psychology student, I like the idea of lemonade based classical conditioning a little bit more. They sing a song and have a little montage about how good of friends they are. I'm not even exaggerating that. One of the lines in the song is, will always be more than a band. And like, bro, who the hell are you gonna sing this to? Literally no one. You're not gonna sing it to anybody. Scott begs for Mo back and Mo says she's not the same girl she was two months ago because she's in a band and that's literally the only thing that has changed. She forgives him, but thank the sweet Lord she doesn't take him back because f this guy. The next day, Lemonade Mouth is playing on the radio. Now I know this is great for them, but the problem is this is extremely illegal. They are unsigned indie artists. They won't see a dime from this song that they wrote, produced, and performed. Also, they never did studio produce this song. It was only ever performed live, but they only ever played versions of the song that sound incredibly well made, which annoys me slightly, but I don't want to be that much of a bitch, so I'ma let this slide for now. Lemonade Mouth is performing and Ray's dumbass, for who some reason even bothers to show up at the pizza parlor at this point, begins to boo them. Like, bro, why? This ends up starting a bit of a... I don't know, a, a food fight? A, a, a bar? A bar fight? A white people kerfuffle. Yeah, a white people kerfuffle. Because there is no ethnic diversity in this movie that isn't associated with Lemonade Mouth. Dante, the owner of the pizza parlor, is no longer allowing them to perform there after this incident. Mo is also coughing a lot, but Beck decides now is a good time to tell her how he feels about her. Yeah, because she's clearly emotionally stable after losing the band's only gig, and he just pointed out that she is clearly sick. Time and place, King. You gotta learn it. Mohini says that she thinks they're better as just friends, and Beck gets so f***ing butthurt about this. He takes this so damn personally. Mohini was really gentle about it too. Bro is just being sensitive. I've been rejected before a lot. And trust me, any of the people I've asked out will tell you that I handled it with grace and style. Thank you, Kennedy. Mohini's dad says no boys and no bands, but Mohini stands her ground and her mom ends up backing her up, so this kind of went nowhere to be honest. Like, I'm glad she stood up for herself, but she's already got so much going on in this movie, I don't get the point of this scene. Like, she has three different plot lines and Stella doesn't even have one anymore except for the fact that half the school hates her because she's different and loud. Which isn't even something they ever touch on in the movie either way, so I wouldn't even go as far as to call that a plot point. In a fit of rage, Beck accidentally crushes his drum in hand, which, well, I guess they're both drum in hands, so he crushes one of his drum in hands, which breaks three of his good fingers. Wen is also asked by his dad to be his best man, which catches him off guard and he hits his eye with a picture frame and gets a black eye. No, f you, this should have given him retina damage. Wen says it's time to call it quits, but this pisses Olivia the f off because her mom is gone and her dad is also gone. And she thinks that Wen is acting like an ungrateful child, which, he is. I just think it's funny that she has this outburst and literally calls him out on his bull Later, the group meets up with Stella because she's protesting the removal of the lemonade machine. And before you say this is stupid, actually no, you'd be right, because this is incredibly stupid. But these two incredibly large men just move right out of the way and everyone takes it upon themselves to assault these two incredibly large men. So instead of going to Rising Star, the group now has to go to prison. Good luck to Wen, cause there's no way he's getting out of this without becoming somebody's prison bitch. Stella gives motivation to the group, but it hardly matters because everyone still blames her for the fact that she did indeed get everyone arrested. There is no two ways around this. This is entirely her fault. 
but not even prison can get in between these five and their frankly scary ability to make music. So after making another damn song out of whatever they can find in the prison cell, they make up with each other and they're let out. Everyone gets picked up again by their respective parties and no one really gets that much screen time except for... Mo? Again? What the f***? Listen, no matter how hard I try, I will never be a 16 year old American Indian girl, but she is acting like she has got the hardest life on the planet, bro. There are two different scenes of her saying she will never be the perfect Indian daughter. My problem isn't with that itself. It's more of the fact that she's getting more screen time than anyone else in this film. I mean, up to this point, Becca's had practically no character development save the point of getting rejected by Mohini. Beck's brother comes to pick him up and he says that he needs to tell his parents that he's an actual human with thoughts and feelings. Spoiler alert, this doesn't even happen because this movie hates Beck or something. This dude is actually getting the Haru in Persona 5 treatment. Stella's mom gives her a little pep talk about how determined and smart she is. And oh boy, one of those things sure is kinda true. But her mom finally says that she is proud of her daughter. I have problems with this scene, but I don't feel like being a bitch right now, so I'm gonna leave it. We cut to Mudslide Crush performing at the Rising Star, and I literally don't care. I mean, this song is literally the most vanglorious sh I've ever heard. The chorus is literally, don't you wish you were us? Who the f*** is going to listen to a song where three guys jerk themselves off for three minutes? If I wanted to do that, I'd listen to any of the Ram Ranch songs. Lemonade Mouth gets on stage to perform, but it goes as well as you'd imagine when you have a pianist who can't see, a singer who can't sing, and another backup singer who also can't sing. Stella doesn't have any issues though, so that part's covered. Scott decides to be useful for once in his damn life and go help the band perform, and the crowd begins to sing as well in place of Lemonade Mouth. This is like if you went to a Kendrick Lamar concert and then Logic and Ed Sheeran got on the stage. Big shocker, but the band didn't actually perform, so they didn't win. Mo, if you take Scott back, I will absolutely lose my mind. Yeah. Yeah? I like that. Mother f***er! I don't care that he's not a dick now. The problem is he did nothing but be terrible to this girl for the entire movie. Beck also sees this, and yeah, I have a problem with this too. But it's fine because he meets this random girl at the end of the movie for literally no reason. Seriously, this goes nowhere. The movie ends in six minutes. Also, this smile is off-putting. Wen gets Olivia a cat, which I appreciate, because that's a cute-ass cat. Wen also finally accepts Sydney as his lawfully wedded MILF. Also, I don't care about either of these people since Sydney is on screen a total of four times and the dad is also on screen for a total of four times. So yeah, really nailing home the fact that they're a happy couple by telling us that three times. Oh, and for some reason, Mel, the creator of Mel's Lemonade, is at the wedding. His appearance at the wedding is never explained, but he donates a whole auditorium to the school. An investment that would cost about three million dollars. He does this because Stella is hot and she asks very, very nicely. Principal Bowser also says that Stella would make a good principal someday because I used to be a bit of a rebel myself. That's right, you heard it here first. Principal Brennigan is actually Radio Rebel. Also, all of the narration for the movie is a letter that Olivia was writing to her father in jail. They also let Scott join the band. You know, this guy has done nothing this whole movie up until the scene at Rising Star. Like, yeah, that was nice of him, but he didn't exactly make himself worthy of anything that he got in this movie. He also never had a scene with any of the main cast except for Mohini. It's also not explained how they got this gig at Madison Square Garden. But it doesn't matter for two reasons. Firstly, this song is a banger. And secondly, the movie is over, so you'll have to save those questions for the sequel. Huh. Yeah. So this movie didn't get a sequel because they couldn't think of a plot for a sequel. I can't say I've ever heard of a movie not getting a sequel because they couldn't think of anything to write. Okay, so that was Lemonade Mouth. And you know what? It was pretty good. One of my main issues with Disney Zombies was that the music in that movie was pretty bad, but the songs in this movie are all actually certified bangers. I wasn't even joking about how good Determinate is, that sh actually goes unbelievably hard. And I joke about not liking the Mudslide Band songs either, but they're pretty okay too. Solid 6 out of 10s to me. Not terrible, but nothing too impressive either. Overall, the music in this film comes to a solid 6 out of 10. The characters in this movie are all pretty good too. I like the characters and all their actors do really well. I remember not being that 
big of a fan of Bridget Mendler's acting in Good Luck Charlie, but she did really good here. My problem with the characters, though, is their dynamics with each other. Like, seriously, they're pretty weak. There's two romances in this movie that go nowhere. One between Wen and Olivia that is so insignificant I didn't even touch on it in this video, and the Charlie and Mohini one. Speaking of which, this guy's name is Charlie, I just call him Beck for the whole video because I like to be stupid. Charlie and Mohini's romance meant nothing in the end. Like seriously, it just served as a way for him to end up breaking his hand and being unable to play the drums. So what was the point of setting Scott up so terribly and making Charlie have feelings for Mohini if both of those things ended up going nowhere. There is no reason for Scott to end up being an important character in this movie. Those scenes were genuinely a waste of time in my opinion. Stephanie and Wen's dad are also a stupid couple. We see them together once before the wedding, technically twice if you count the scene where he drops her off at the beginning of the movie. Also, the fact that he's marrying someone who's probably half her age is kinda crazy. Bob Jesser is the actor for Wen's dad, but, and I'm not kidding you when I say this, I could not find his age anywhere. But let's assume that he's 40. So yeah, a 12 year age gap is kind of weird, especially if you have a 16 year old kid who now has a 28 year old mom. I think that's kind of taboo, but not technically morally reprehensible. So yeah, I don't really think that this movie handled romance really well. I also don't know if Mohini was supposed to be this movie's main character or what, because she got an annoying amount of screen time. Charlie is such an underdeveloped character and he doesn't even get an end to the story with his parents. Like seriously, it just doesn't happen. Mohini annoys me because the entire movie seems to revolve around her. The Scott plotline, her dad, Charlie, they all exist, but they all come to relatively unsatisfying conclusions. She's also just not that interesting of a person in the first place. Her character herself is just kind of bland. Her whole thing is that she doesn't know who she is, but she literally does. They just use the fact that she's Indian American as a plot device. Stella is fun though. All jokes aside, she's really well written in a very stable character for this movie. Her motivations stay consistent throughout. Although some of her dialogue is unbelievably cringe inducing, Haley Kyoko does a really great job of delivering it. Stella is a very fun character in my opinion and should have been the lead for this movie if they felt like they needed one. But I kind of noticed this movie kind of didn't know what to do with her, like in between the second and third act. This movie isn't even really that fun to be honest. It's described as a musical comedy, but I couldn't tell you a single joke that they made in this film. Like even in the Disney Zombies review, I kept in two random clips in that movie because I thought they were just genuinely funny in their own right, and I didn't even like that movie. But this movie does have pretty good slash average writing in my opinion. All the characters outside of Sela have good scripts because her writing is just cringy for some reason, and I'd go so far as to say that all of the actors enhance the scripts that they are given. I was gonna go over everything else, but all of it is incredibly average. The sound design, set design, stakes, camera work, cinematography, it's all a solid 6 or 7. There's not much to talk about for any of it. So let's go ahead and close this review out. For the critical score, I'm going to give this movie a 6 out of 10. This movie ain't that special, but it's got good music and pretty good acting. And in my opinion, most of the characters are pretty likable. For the fun score, it's going to get a 5 out of 10 though. It's not really that interesting to watch. Like I legitimately couldn't even say that you should bother like getting drunk or even watching this film with friends. It's not much of a turn your brain off and watch film, at least not compared to a lot of the other films I've reviewed on this channel. There's just nothing special about it. So in the end, just kind of gets lost in the shuffle of every other Disney Channel movie that has ever existed. Anyway, come back next week when we will watch Radio Rebel. This is the part of the video where I tell you to follow me on my socials and say something funny for the outro.